Well, welcome everyone to the Anvil and Hammer episode number five. I'm Hi. Sean. And I'm Sarah. Interrupting Sarah. <laughs> right, so on today's episode, we have interviewed a good friend of ours, a man who goes by the name of Saitin Brudenkat. I grew up in South Africa. I studied Afrikaans, which is a derivative of Dutch. What? And I'm pretty sure I said that nearly 100% correctly. No, I didn't. Might have not. Sight Sorry, and, Sai. Sight and Brugenkate. We discussed the approach of apologetics known as presuppositional <laughs> apologetics. And we discussed what that's all about. So I hope you enjoy this. Hope you get lots out of it. And make sure to leave a comment of any questions that you might have after this. Enjoy. Well, welcome, Sai. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. Good to hook up with you again. It's, it's nice to finally meet your wife, as we did prior to logging on here. It's uh, yeah. wonderful to finally meet her. It's lovely to meet you, too. It's very exciting to have you on and to learn more about pre-sup. It took me a long time. I remember when Sean was getting into it. It took me a long time to wrap my head around it. But actually, when you kind of break it down, it's very, very simple. And, you know, I don't think of, I haven't thought of, Christianity in, in the same way since it's given me great tools to understand the faith better how to share my faith better and how to engage with people better even if uh, you don't necessarily use the arguments or you know the lingo so yeah it's... amen that's what I tell people I say this apologetic is not about a cool way to argue it's life-changing mm -hmm. when you understand mm -hmm. the authority of scripture yeah. but uh, as I was uh, telling Sean earlier um it's women that actually helped me understand this apologetic better. And I can recall uh, speaking at a men's conference, of course, men's conference, only men there. And uh, I think it was uh, three different sessions. I spoke like four hours or something like that. And I was receiving emails from some of these men afterwards. They went home and they explained to their wives what the apologetic was. And they say, oh, yeah, that's simple. I get it. <laughs> and I find that it's, it's women that helped me understand. And the, and the way the reason that this happened was uh, one of my very first lectures, I think it might even be my first lecture on the topic, I was talking about, and we'll get into the definition of presuppositional apologetics, but I was talking about what is necessary to even argue, like the preconditions of, uh, of intelligibility and like logic is universal, abstract, invariant, all these things. And the guys were loving it. They said, I can go out and I could demolish my opponent now. And I saw the women in the audience look like they were falling asleep. You know, their eyes were glazing over and they thought, I, before I had to learn all this evidence and now I have to learn the preconditions of intelligibility. Are you kidding me? And it was then that, that I realized that it's not about the philosophy of the argument. It's relational. So now if I go to a talk, I start off by saying like this. I say, you know, what? I'm going to throw you a bit of a curve today. I'm not going to teach you how to defend your faith in God. I've decided to teach you how to defend your faith that your parents exist. And they look at me like, uh, like I have two heads. Like, like, what are you doing here? And I said, you know, I love the way that you're looking at me now because that would be crazy. It would be crazy for me to come here and teach you how to defend the fact that your parents exist. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you know your parents and you know them better than I do. I said, why is this crazy Canadian coming all this way to teach you how to defend your belief that God exists? Mm -hmm. You know him. Talk about him. Talk about him the way the Bible describes him. That's apologetic. And that's what this apologetic is, as you'll come to see in you know, the bare bones of the apologetic. And women get that, I think, a lot quicker than men because men have the testosterone that they need to win the argument. And the women will say, well, this is what the Bible says. You don't believe it? I'll pray for you. Mm -hmm. So... What is your website? Because this is, before we even watch this, you should stop listening and go check out Sai's website and then come back to this. The website is www, I don't know why people say that anymore, but www.proofthatgodexists.org. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it's just sitting out there. I don't do a lot of work on the website. Every once in a while, I'll upload a video, but it's just basically a, a run through of, um, you know, um, a click through argument where you get to the proof that God exists. And also, if you dig through it, I didn't want to put it on the front page because it turned off a lot of people, but there's also the tulip test. Have you seen the tulip test on my website? I have, actually. Yeah, it's... it's, it's okay, we won't talk about that. We don't want to scare off half, three quarters of your listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I don't know what your listeners were like if they're mostly uh, ref of the reformed ilk, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a test that, um, that um, explains one of the points of uh, the reformed faith, I would say. Yeah, of Christian soteriology. It's, yeah, it's mm -hmm. helpful in understanding what the Bible has to say about that subject. Yeah, I think our listener base is comprises of my mother and maybe one other friend. <laughs> we love you, Di. <laughs> so, Hello. Nice to meet you. 
No, it's, it's been rightly said that you have done a lot to bring presuppositional apologetics from the, the lecture hall in the university down to the street. And I, what I want this episode to really encapsulate is that it needs to now move from the street into the home. So that's sort of the theme mm. and topic that I want to talk about. But uh, for people who might not know anything about presuppositional apologetics, because I suppose I want to aim this more towards people who are familiar with it. Do you want to do a brief overview of what exactly is presup in a nutshell? Presuppositional apologetics is starting with the existence and word of God. The argument is that we start with God. That's how the Bible starts. In the beginning, God. There is no proof that God exists in Scripture. It just starts with in the beginning, God. Mm -hmm. And in Romans 11, 36, it says, From him, through him, and to him are all things. All things include science. They include logic. They include morality. So I am not going to give these things to the unbeliever in order to argue with them about God. I say these things are from God. So a presupposition that says, look, I start with the existence of God. That's what the Bible does. And I'm saying, if you do not start with the existence of God, then you can't even have this discussion with me. And of course, they say, well, what are you talking about? I say, well, the Bible says that God is necessary to start, you know, and it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You need God to have knowledge. So you deny the existence of God. How can you have knowledge? And then, you know, you start pick apart to pick apart their worldview. So I'm not trying to prove that God exists. I start with the existence of God. And I say that any argument that basically concludes that God exists doesn't need him for that argument. It isn't the God that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The God that I believe in is necessary to even argue about anything. Presuppositional apologetic is starting with the authority of Scripture and not giving it up when you contend for the faith. That's a, a great quick explanation. You start with God's existence and God's word. And as I said earlier, it it's very edifying for the believer because it gives us the confidence in God's word and it takes the weight off us to feel that we have to prove God's existence to them. You know, it's, um, it's, you know, we have that confidence that they know that God exists so we can present them with truth and try to appeal to their consciences and then trust God with the result, with whatever God wills. So I, I love the way that you word that because for me and for many people that I explain this apologetic to, that's exactly the feeling they get. It's a relief. Mm -hmm. Because here they thought they had to study astrophysics and nuclear chemistry, nuclear biology, and all these things in order to argue with the unbeliever. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying those things are a bad thing to know because God has given us these areas that we can study his creation. Mm -hmm. But if you would do apologetics wrong, you have to be brilliant. You have to know all of these things. But if you do apologetics a biblical way, mm -hmm. Jesus says that we have to be prepared to give a reason hope, you know, a reason defense of our faith. We have to be able to respond to answer that command. God uses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. And that's uh, something that encourages me because, you know, like you said, I'd never be able to learn all this lingo and these term terms. And, right. uh, you know, I'm quite a simple person. And, in you know, I trust God with that. And I praise God for the fact that he uses someone like me and can use someone like me to um, share the gospel with someone in a in a very authentic and, and real way you know hitting the conscience and getting down to the worldview and to the core and not getting distracted by all those things right so. what i find more often than not is that i get into the philosophy just to you know deal with an objection then i get back to preaching the gospel but i can still remember early on in my presuppositional career i was uh, talking with this woman she's actually from the uk and i spent a lot of time we even talked on the phone quite a bit I was using the presuppositional argumentation. And, you know, I scold people. I don't scold them, but when people say I did presup on them, I said, you know, never tell me that again. Tell me that you honored Jesus Christ as Lord, because that's basically what the apologetic is. I would use the methodology with this woman. And, you know, it was interesting. Of course, you know, there's no, uh, there's no answer to this. But that at one time I asked her if she was ever thankful. She had a daughter. And I said, are you ever thankful? And she says, yeah, of, of course I'm, I'm thankful. I said, who do you thank? And she said that question made more of an impact than the hours I spent discussing with her the philosophy of presuppositional apologetics. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, if anything else, that's what this apologetic does. It gives you confidence to talk with a person that you can answer any objection they have yeah. if you do it from Scripture. And that's what I'm trying to gear the apologetic towards now is that when people ask me a question, answer it with a biblical answer. And I think that is going to be, that's the power that God uses to save people. He uses the power of the gospel. He doesn't use my argument. He doesn't Jesus did not say my sheep here size really good argument. 
Mm-hmm. He says, my sheep hear my voice. And, and the women that I tell her say, oh, fantastic. I love it. I'm just going to share the gospel with them. I'm going to tell them what the Bible says. But the guy is out there. He wants to win the argument with the guy who crushed him last year because he used, you know, a, a really bad evidential argument. So I'm part of many uh, Facebook groups, presuppositional Facebook groups, and I'm convinced that about 70 percent of the people in these groups do not understand presuppositional apologetics. So I'm going to give you some some uh, propositions, some statements, and I want Uh-oh. you to say if they're true or false, and then explain yourself. So um, okay, <laughs> all right. So presuppositionalism is not about winning arguments, true or false. I would say that's true. I I say it's a consequence. Hmm. You know, you will win arguments, but it's not about that. Great. It's not about debating epistemology. Yeah, I would I would agree with that as well, because I think that presuppositionists fall into the trap very often of arguing epistemology for six hours with the same person that they would have argued evidence with for six hours. Exactly. Mm-hmm. They turn this into an evidential argument. Right, exactly. They argue, you know, the Bible says that this person does not have the ability to argue or cannot justify argumentation without God. And we reduce it to an argument about epistemology. We get fooled by them. We get fooled by the unbeliever. One thing I want to caution people that are listening now as well is that I've often done this talk and I say, well, the Bible says that these people actually do know that God exists. And they go out and they start calling unbelievers liars. Mm. And I say, you got to be very careful with that. Are some of them lying? Sure. But Greg Bonson, who I learned most of this apologetic from, as I had said, did his doctoral dissertation of the phenomena of self-deception. Yes. And the Bible in Romans 1 says that people, these people are deceiving themselves, that they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And that might be very similar to lying, but I think that if you confront the unbeliever, I would not call them liars because that's immediately objectionable. I would just say what the Bible says, that you're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, that you really do know that God exists. Hmm. So last one, presuppositional apologetics is not about tag, which is the transidental argument for the existence of God. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. In fact, I don't use the tag argument. You know, maybe I did early on in my argumentation. Greg Bonson has been criticized of this as well because he says God is a necessary precondition for intelligibility. There is intelligibility, therefore God exists. That's the basic tag. Hmm. And um, people say, well, um, how do we know this? How do we know that God is in, you know, the premise one? And he says, by the impossibility of the contrary. Mm-hmm. Now we get into more, some of the more of the deep, you know, slogging philosophical stuff. But people have argued you cannot prove that the contrary is impossible. And I only heard it, I believe, on one or two of Greg Bonson's lectures. But somebody asked him, how do we know that the contrary is impossible? And he says, well, because the Bible says so. Mm-hmm. Psalm 96, 5, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So if I were to modify the tag, and it's implied in the tag argument, but I would say, God is a necessary precondition for intelligibility as he has revealed in his word. Mm. You know, so it just, and they say, well, I don't accept that. I say, fine, you don't have to accept it, but tell me how you get intelligibility without him. Yeah. And again, you know, now you're talking about the philosophical argument. And what I've also found is that most of the people that you meet have no idea what you're talking about. Mm. I mean, even words like epistemology. And so I learned these things and that's how I would argue on the street. And the thing that really steered me away from arguing that way is being out on the street and seeing people who had heard my debates, who had you know read the stuff that I'd written, and talking to some person about the preconditions of intelligibility, and and it made me want to puke, because these people have no idea what they're talking about, and you know they're not getting to the gospel. Mm. And I thought, you know, it's not about that. Mm. It's about starting with the authority of God's God's word and not leaving it. Now, if you run into a philosophy student, sure, you can talk about stuff like that, but I don't believe it's necessary. Because what I tell people, I say, can you imagine if you know you run to the, the Apostle Paul and you ask him about the preconditions of intelligibility? He says, well, what are you talking about, man? You know, and I think that's not how he would defend the faith. He, you know, or, or Peter, he was with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that's how he would defend the faith. That's what he would talk about. I would describe the person's status from Scripture. This is why you need him and do it with all the confidence that they have no objection to what you're saying. And if they object, let them walk away. Yeah. Because God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It will penetrate. It will penetrate his sheep. Yeah, I think that's so important just to get to the heart of the issue because, you know, I, I was three years in uni and, you know, the early days of when we encountered pre-self, you know, we obviously meet lots of philosophy students and, even if you don't study philosophy, you know, students are just interested in that, you know, they think a lot. And, um, you know, I remember engaging with 
philosophy students using this kind of argumentation and they you know they loved it because it sounds intelligent you know I, I think it, it can fuel pride and arrogance and I learned afterwards that what I needed to do in that situation was hit the conscience you know just stand on the authority of God's word and then hit the conscience you know they know that God exists they they need to repent of their sin they need to submit to God and turn to him mm. and uh, you know so I think yeah it, it's something that can be learned yeah amen um because I I recall early on in my um, apologetics career I guess you could call it you know people would watch a William Lane Craig debate and they would say I could never do that that guy is brilliant. I could never do that. Mm -hmm. And they watch one of my debates and say, I can do that. And that actually one of the biggest compliments I've ever gotten is that I can do that. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is that a lot of presuppositions are becoming, you know, what I say is that they're falling in love with the argument. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, it's a beautiful, mm -hmm. powerful argument that God has equipped us, equipped us with. But people out there are falling in love with the argument rather than the Lord of the argument. And, you know, also, I think that there is definitely pride involved, too, because if you've had terrible arguments shoved down your throat, you want to return a favor. Mm. And even early on in my conversations, people would say that I don't appear to be very loving. And, you know, I take that to heart as well. I think that a lot of them are, you know, the clips are, are taken out of context. But one thing that Doug Wilson had said that in one of his sermons that, I, you know, was really impactful, he says that if you're in a apologetic or in a conversation with a professed unbeliever, and somebody walks into that conversation at any point, and it does not look like you want that person to be saved, you're probably doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. The thing is, we have to try to win the person, which, of course, we can't do outside of the power of the Holy Spirit, but we should seek to win the person rather than the argument. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that presuppositional apologetics is an approach. In a sentence, it's seeking to answer like Jesus. So if you want to learn presup, read the Bible and examine right. and study closely how Jesus answers objections and challenges because he does that a lot and how the apostles did so. And that's, that, that's how you learn precept. So Sai, how would you then bring this into the home? How would you teach this to children? Because I think one sign that you have mastered any field of study is if you can explain it to children and they can understand it. So do you have any tips that you could give people? Yeah, well, people? I'm, I'm really glad that you brought this up. And, um, I, you know, I'd seen this before, but I would just, I turn on the television here and there's a Christian TV network and they were interviewing Sean McDowell. Now, Sean McDowell, you know, I, I hope he's a brother in the Lord. I believe that he is. You know, he's an evidentialist like, like I was at one point. But he's repeated this on a number of interviews. And I actually just saw it before coming to this um, podcast, this interview. And one thing he said was that, you know, as he was, I don't know, late teens, early 20s or so, he sat down with his father in a restaurant and he said, you know, Dad, um, I, I'm i having trouble. Actually, I, I'm not even sure that this Christianity is true. And his father says, that's great. I want you to examine the evidences and come to a firm belief that this, you know, I'm paraphrasing, of course. Hmm. And this likens the worldly mantra that people have to teach their children how to think but not teach them what to think. Mm. And I think that is absolutely absurd. We have to teach them both. And this is the example that I use. I say, if your child is approaching a hot stove and you're not going to try to teach the child how to think, you know, how to think is that when you touch that stove and burn yourself, you're going to realize that it's not logical to do that and you'll never do it again. That teaches them how to think by letting them touch the stove. If you teach them what to think, you say, that stove is hot, don't touch it. So what I would encourage parents to do is not only teach them how to think, but teach them what to think. Mm. Teach them the truth of God's word. And children get this apologetic. Children understand it. It's the world that has duped us into professing something that we don't believe. And I think, you know, there's reasons for that because we want to be accepted by the world. If you go and knock on a door, you're about to go to a party and you say, you know, what? I could be wrong about this, but Jesus has really made my life better. And, you know, if you accept Jesus into your heart, then you could be a Christian and you can go to heaven. And your life will be better, too. You know, but I, I could be wrong, you know, but I, I would love to talk to some of the Muslims and, you know, maybe we could discuss worldviews and, and find out who's right. Come on in, you know, that, that you'd be welcome at that party. Or you go to that door to the party and you say, you know, it's absolutely true that God exists and that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sinners. And you need to, you need to repent and put your trust in him or you're going to hell. They're going to say, get out of here. <laughs> I, I hear the alarm. But they can say, no, get out of here, because, you know, they don't want that exclusivity. Of course, all worldviews are exclusive. People don't realize that. Mm -hmm. But and I think a lot of Christians 
want to be accepted in those type of communities and instead of speaking the truth of God's word. So what I would encourage, back to your question, parents to talk to children about is teach them the word of God and teach them that it is true to think that it is true and how to think about it, not basically let them make the mind up on their own. And I see Christian after Christian in interviews, my parents allow me to make up my own mind about what to believe. I say, no, no, you don't do that in other fields. You don't do that in the hot stove. You know, that it's not right. Let them make up their own mind whether it's right to touch a hot stove. You tell them not to touch the hot stove. You know, so why do we do this in the Christian field? Talk to them about the truth of Christianity and do not sway from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I sort of reckon presuppositional apologetics or just the Bible and compares, comparing it to mathematics, right? How do you know mathematics is true? Well, you have to assume it in order to use it, right? You have to assume that one right. plus one equals two. But then you also prove it through the impossibility of the contrary. So if you say, well, you know, two, one plus one does not equal two, equals something else. Well, then go build a bridge. You're not going to be able to. So that's it's the same approach to the Bible. It's that, yes, we assume it to be true, but if you deny it to be true, well, then you see the consequences of that. And I think explaining it like with ter with terminology and things that children already understand will help them come to an understanding of what this is about. Right. You wouldn't you wouldn't only you wouldn't only teach them how to think about one plus one. You teach them to think that that one plus one equals two. Yeah. And like I say, we do this in these fields. But for some reason, we feel we have to give the children some kind of room to think mm -hmm. about Christ, to think about the truth of the Bible. So we don't mm -hmm. do that in any other field. Why do we do it in this field? Mm -hmm. Teach them what is true. Teach them how to think and teach them what to think. Mm -hmm. I just want to quickly read. Uh, if you ever read the end of Joshua, it says that, are you going to follow God and his precepts? And the people say, yes, we're going to follow God and his precepts. And then you read Judges straight afterwards, and it tells you what happens. It says, so when all the generation that had been gathered to their fathers together, uh, gathered to their fathers, another generation rose after them. And this is what they did. They did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. And then from that point, you see all the horrors of the judges. So the, the generation that... Uh, went into the promised land, they kept the, the precepts, but they forgot to teach it to their children, and they forgot it in this way. They forgot to teach who God is and what he had done for Israel. So who God is, the attributes of God, and what he had done for Israel, as in the Bible, as a history book. It is history. And I think this is the key to teaching presuppositional apologetics to children, is for them to understand who God is in the scriptures. So when they're older... And someone comes up, says, give me proof that God exists. And you say, proof that God exists? God is omnipotent. Why do I need to give you proof that God exists? This isn't the God of the Bible that I know, that I've been learning my entire life. Would right. you agree with that uh, train of thought? Or do you have anything to add? Well, like I say in the film, too, I say if somebody comes up to you and says, you know, give me proof that words exist. You know, you wouldn't pull out a dictionary or one of those children's alphabets and prove them that words exist. You'd say, you're using them. You can even ask that question without using them. Why don't people have that reaction with God? Yeah. God is the necessary foundation for words. And somebody says, I don't believe that God exists. And, you know, I was training this uh, friend of mine in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah, I think it's in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's, been, it's been a while since I've been there. But she does some street evangelism. And she's had it happen twice where a professed atheist comes up to her and says, um, yeah, I'm an atheist. And she says, no, you're not. And she said it's happened to her twice where they just drop their heads and they shouldn't be, yeah. You know, now, that's not going to happen every time, but that's how simple it is. Tell, him, tell the person what the Bible says about them, and Jesus' sheep will hear his voice. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's it. So, Sarah and I, we've been working on a, a board game called The Armory, and it's a way to teach children the scriptures in a fun and interactive way. It's trying to encourage fathers in the home to train their children. And it's something that we're going to use with our son when he gets a bit older. We're going to start teaching him these concepts, these things, uh, through a game, through interaction. And that's what we're hoping to do. But for any listeners, I encourage you to teach your children about these things. They might seem in-depth, but we need to be able to communicate them at a young age to the children. So when they grow up, these things are embedded in them, and they know them. And that this will... You know, I think often our, our evangelism is that we want results too quickly. But what I see in Scripture is that the means for church growth is through the family, through the home. And if you can train your children, who will then train their children, who will train their children, you'll have a multi-generational impact of your ministry. So the home is the primary primary ministry of every man, every household, is the father leading his home, teaching his children the scriptures, and then encouraging them to have their own families one day to teach the scriptures. Amen, brother.
This is Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So there's a direct command in Scripture for fathers to train their children and not pass that responsibility mm. onto somebody else. So that's something that Sarah and I are trying to encourage in our local church, something we're trying to encourage through the anvil and hammer, and then obviously through the armory itself as well, that board game. And that's what Amen. we want to see. We want to see fathers teaching their children precept. Well, it's called it's called from the lips of little ones a study in the catechism for very little people. Apparently, the the way that this book was published is that uh, his daughter he uh, she put the book together and submitted it out, you know without his knowledge and it was accepted and they published it. But you know, especially if you're working on that board game, I'd encourage you to look it up. I don't know if you can uh, see a Kindle version or something online, but look it up because it has very simple question and answer that I think would work perfectly with a board game. Great, it sounds fantastic. Yeah, one of the, the one of the ways around the board game is that it's designed around the father introducing questions. So it's cu customizable. So you could definitely get this book, uh, you know, get get the questions and then adapt it to the game. It's designed. Oh, that's to do great. That. Yeah. You can make a board game for wee ones, for little ones. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could, uh, you know, adjust or even a different set of cards for uh, different age groups. I think that would be fantastic. Well, the cards say, ask the, ask the game master for a question and then you get so right. many points for that. So, the, the game master or the, or the father, whoever's running the game, can really customize those questions to whatever they want. Yeah, that's great. In our church, the children, once they learn all the questions and answers, they, they get a Bible. And some of them do it at a very young age. And I'm thinking that I couldn't answer all of them. And I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm disappointed that I did not. I still something that I would like to do is even learn those very basic questions and answers. And uh, I think that you'd be surprised how many times these things come up. And of course, there are, you know, it's from the catechism, so it's mm -hmm. biblically based and, you know, there's solid questions and answers. And, and I think if you could equip children like that with the board game, I think that would be a huge blessing. Yeah. Uh, well, I just wanted to um, plug, uh, you mentioned Eric Hovind earlier on. and uh, Yeah, he's a good friend of mine. The, yeah, I, I saw some of the... the uh, stuff you've done together some of the videos and and debates and stuff and uh we uh recently well, when it came out we got the genesis movie we have on blu-ray oh and, right uh, mm -hmm. so i just want to plug that because uh for families it's a fantastic movie and i think it's a good example of how uh evidentialism is great for believers you know it really encourages believers and edifies us to really know yeah god's word is true and this is how it's reflected in the world amen yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a nitpicker, so I would differentiate between evidentialism and evidences. I know exactly oh, what right. you mean, yeah. but I think evidentialism is basically giving evidences to prove God. Now, I, you know, I could oh, even okay. be wrong in my definition of it, but I think evidences are wonderful for Christians to show the glory of God. I think that's fantastic. That's why, you know, I love, I haven't seen the film yet. Eric sent me a link a little while ago. I hope he doesn't listen to it. Well, actually, I hope he does listen to it, but I haven't watched it yet. Eric, if you're listening, I, I will watch it soon because I understand that it's a, you know, a, a great production. And as a Christian, I love these evidences because I'm a Christian, mm. but I think evidentialism is using these evidences to prove God, which I think is contrary to what the Bible says. And of course, yeah. people object to that, but I will be happy to engage them on that as well. well. One thing I tell people, I say, let let's say that uh, you know, evidentialism is true. It is the way to go. And let's say that you're about to witness to one of your friends who professes unbelief, and you're loaded with all of these evidences. And as you're going to that person, they get hit by a bus. Does anybody believe that that person has an excuse when they stand before God? I have not heard one Christian said, yeah, yeah, they'll have an excuse. No, they're without excuse. Why? Mm. Because they already know. Mm. Then what are we doing presenting them with all these evidences? Can we use evidences in our evangelism? Absolutely. As long as we use it, you know, to point to the glory of God and not to try and prove him. Yeah. Well, Sai, si, I think we could talk to you all day. We've actually <laughs> just come to an hour, so... Is there well, any, any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Well, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I, I do agree with that, that we could talk all day because uh, my conversation with you that it's on your YouTube channel is one of the favorite ones that I've had. I mean, just, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how you interacted with me, how, how you uh, played the fall. I, I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed this and I will be happy to share it. And hopefully um, your mother and perhaps my mother will listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, wonderful. Right, well, there you have it, the interview with Sai. Hope you found that interesting. What are your after-the-interview thoughts, Sarah? Well, he's a really nice guy. Really nice guy, there we go. I really enjoyed it, it was great. Yeah, yeah it was great. We, we, we could literally talk to him all day. I had to sort of 
put the foot down and say, well, we better call it there because... We did have a screaming baby. We did have a screaming baby. And it was, um, I think it was, it was wrapping up nicely where we had it. And But yeah, I think it's something that we could talk about all day. How to answer like Jesus is what we're really talking about. And how to teach it to our children who are making baby noises. Right, I think it's hammer time. Maybe that's copyright. Maybe we shouldn't do that. So, Sarah, you have to guess where the scripture's from. Ooh. Quote, A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Mm. Okay, I'm just going to... I know it's Proverbs. But I'm just going to take a shot in the dark because I have no idea where. I'm, I'm going to say 7... Mm, oh, 13.1. Wow, amazing. <laughs> Proverbs thirteen one. What a guess! <laughs> Not like you showed it's, me or anything. It's it's easy to guess when you see it right in front of your face. Yes, it's Proverbs thirteen one. A very poignant scripture. A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. So, mm -hmm. this implies that fathers are to instruct their children in wisdom, and that the sign of a scoffer is one who does not listen to correction, one who does not listen to rebuke. With confidence as well, because in the interview, as you just listened, you know, so I said some Christian parents kind of leave it to their kids to decide on the truth of Christianity, but that's not biblical. It's biblical to stand on the authority of God's word and teach them what's true. There you have it. Right. Make sure to check out the Armory Bible board game. Check out the blog that is there. And I hope you found this episode encouraging, convicting, and that you learned something. I'm Sean Bradford with my wife, Sarah Bradford, with our baby, Enoch Bradford. And we're going to sign out now. Okay, see ya. Goodbye. I don't speak Irish, but my wife does. Okay. No, I don't. I don't speak it. I know. I know some of it, but there you go. Slan. Anyway, right. So long. Farewell. <laughs>